Welcome to Charity Village Connects. Today, we're exploring new revenue sources for charities and nonprofits, including having a social enterprise arm to supplement revenues. Today, we're talking to Dan Kershaw, the executive director at Furniture Bank, one of Canada's rapidly growing social enterprise-minded charities that creates homes from empty housing through the gift of furniture. Dan holds an MBA from the Richard Ivey School of Business and a master's in environmental studies from the University of Waterloo. Dan lectures with colleges and universities on social enterprise and their critical role in a healthy charity. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for having me. I wonder if we could just start uh, to be talking about your organization a little bit. Can you tell us about your organization's mission and the work that you actually do? Sure. Uh, And I think it's important we start with some context. Uh, we, We all talk about that we have a homelessness crisis. We all hear that we need more housing as a solution, but the moving from uh, having an empty housing doesn't actually solve homelessness, and that's where uh, organizations like ourselves uh, come have come into being. So we're 24 years young, and we sit at that intersection between somebody able to secure empty housing, and uh, we pr- collect uh, community goods. Yeah, which we'll talk about later later on, uh, and match those uh, two families coming out of uh, uh, agencies from a, a variety of sectors. So anybody coming out of some form of crisis, they secure housing, they need the beds, the sofas, the dining room, the uh, appliances, anything that we all enjoy today. So our mission is very simple, is to pr- maximize the number of families that we can support getting into a furnished, established home. And your, your actual customers, or rather the people who are donating the furniture, actually pay for the service of having their furniture picked up, and then, uh, and then they receive a tax receipt for the items that they donate. Is, is, that, is that correct? That, that's correct. And a bit of background is days when we all, as society, like moving furniture end around 25, when beer and pizza was enough for us to move a sofa, a chair, and the like. Um, we get to a point where we all uh, are quite happy to either just make it somebody else's problem, uh, try and give it away, but ultimately people hate moving furniture. So uh, back in 2004, when the charity itself was seeing the social need uh, growing exponentially, the rate at which people were bringing their own furniture that they wanted to donate to us was flat or declining because of this friction point. And the whole spirit behind social enterprise is you're providing a service or product that's that's meeting a need in the market. So here in Toronto, uh, we have uh, 30 different for-profit junking companies, and they will charge you a hefty sum to get the same sofa we'll come and get. The difference is they'll run it to the closest landfill transfer station and destroy it. And our model was simply to compete uh, at the same performance level as a junker but to provide all the uh, associated benefits. So yes, if you called today uh, and you were downsizing a whole home or an apartment or uh, dining room tables, whatever you have that's in a home, uh, we we would be taking that information, arriving at a quote. And that quote is, would be no different than what you pay a junker. And what we're trying to do is give the market an opportunity to have a socially and environmentally responsible alternative to destroying perfectly good things. So the benefit to the customer is they, yes, they are paying a market fee, but they are they save on the tax. There's no HST. They get a charitable tax receipt for the donated goods. Uh, and uh, the proceeds of those actually help offset the costs of uh, doing deliveries uh, to the families that we're supporting. So our cycle time, so the speed at which furniture that would leave your house and make its way back into the community pre-pandemic is around 72 hours. So it's a very uh, active and fluid social enterprise, uh, as any transportation company would be. Well, it's, I mean, it's environmentally very sustainable in terms of what this reuse of perfectly good furniture. And at the same time, you're actually providing a service in kind of a win-win scenario where... Um, the donator is able to solve a problem and uh, and also receive a tax receipt, and at the same time, they feel good about helping the community by providing somebody um, with this very much needed kind of furniture for their for their new home. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's an important point for, for the listeners that uh, customers who are engaging your social enterprise at a certain level don't care that you have a social and environmental mission. They have a, we have to compete at the same standard as when you heard got junk or just junk or any of those. And they, they operate as in some cases, multinationals. So there's a service standard that customers are expecting. They aren't, uh, we have all these, these extra benefits, but if our service is bad, if our uh, pricing is out of whack or any of the other things that as consumers, uh, we don't get, you know, social enterprises on, on large will not get a, a pass. So we're always constantly looking for how do we make sure that the, the fear, full value set is very clear for the customers. Over 3,000 tra uh, tractor trailers worth of furniture have been collected through our social enterprise over the since 2004. And then the uh, those items that are reusable have been passed on to the, those families at that cycle time. So it's a very exciting. There's a whole environmental uh, aspect to it in terms of extending la uh, life and carbon uh, footprints and things which we're learning about now. Well, I'd like to, I mean, it's obvious why a fee-for-service model would be in your um, best interest in terms of running your organization effectively. I guess what I'd like to understand, though, is what was the thinking process in making that decision, especially given that you were such an early adopter of social enterprise as part of your operations, um, as opposed to doing free pickups, which uh, I, I guess at one time you did? Yeah, and, and ma many charities do. So in our, in our space, uh, our sector, there are you know, the idea of a furniture bank, while most people, most listeners have never heard of a furniture bank until now, um, there's about 160 across North America and they all target that same activity, but they're all very different. Most of them uh, offer free pickup, but you know, from my perspective, who can actually do free? Um, the, there are lots of uh, charities that exist that are purely volunteer driven, but the, you know, how long can a charity sustain you know, free space, free trucks, free staff, free, 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 when gas is gas, insurance is insurance, real rent is rent, electricity is electricity. Um, so I don't think free is a viable model that's us today, but we got into it um, We with the Toronto Enterprise Fund. Uh, they uh, We were in a bit of a crisis that the, the goods that we needed to come uh, weren't magically showing them showing their way uh, to our warehouse uh, in Toronto and the Toronto Enterprise Fund pulled us through some of the principles and the expectations that go into running a social enterprise. So 2004, uh, we got our first truck. Uh, we hired our first employee related to the, the pickup business, as we call it, uh, our internal lingo. And that started a journey. Uh, and today we're uh, 10 trucks uh, running on the road. When we have this pickup enterprise working, every truck that's fully operationalized is equivalent of a major gift every month. So this is not small potatoes. It is complex. It is not. Uh, it is its own uh, ecosystem of uh, responsibilities and accountabilities. But it is quite transformational in terms of what the capacity of the charity can do. So we started as a volunteer helping a few hundred families uh, every given year. Now we're helping 3,000 families. We're trying to scale and have the ability to scale to support a national in infrastructure. And none of that would have been possible if we didn't have the underlying social enterprise infrastructure. It's an amazing story and, and an amazing success story. Um, I, I guess on top of that, you also have um, not just the pickup program, you also have the, what's called the leg up program, which is a social hire program. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Sister Anne, uh, fa who founded this charity uh, 25 years ago, uh, it was part of her uh, ethos that in helping people get out of homelessness, part of it is having not just a job, but having the ability to be a part of giving back to the community and in some cases create careers. So it is, we have woven throughout our organization, this principle of creating, you know, social hire opportunities. So they may be three month placements to for training, or they may be long-term careers at Furniture Bank, but of the 45 uh, full-time employees we have, 65% of them all came to us through this program where we were creating opportunities in the warehouse, in the trucks uh, since 2015 in our uh, furniture repair workshop. 
which has been a big success and a big focus for the future. Uh, call center, all those things, uh, and people move up through through the organization into all the roles. So it's not a it's not a come in, go into a room, get trained, and leave model, which is they call a serial employment model. We have a parallel employment model where uh, Mero uh, left Seton House 15 years ago and uh, has been with us ever since. Uh, so the idea is that if people wish to stay and be an active contributor to Furniture Bank's growth and expansion and impact, they're welcome to do so. And for others, uh, we're, we provide the job readiness and support so that they can get uh, their longer term career paths uh, organized. That's so very impressive. And, and I also think... Um... It highlights, along with your description of the actual social enterprise, that there are obviously certain challenges around a charity who might be operating very much using traditional funding models to try and start up uh, a social enterprise, that there could be significant challenges in terms of even having the skill sets necessary to run a complex business within it. Would you say that that's one of the main challenges um, for a, a nonprofit that might be thinking of this? It starts with mindset. Um, we were fortunate at the time to have a board and some staff who had the mindset that it is possible. Um, I often say if my staff are fed up of it. Uh, yes, if versus no, because you can say, let's start a social enterprise in my charity or nonprofit, and you will have lots of people lining up to say, no, because, no, because, no, because. If you flip it around and you have a board member that said, yes, we could, if this was possible, it changes the mindset of staff, management, and the board to start exploring what are the preconditions to be able to start. We were fortunate to get some support and training and exposure to this whole idea of running a business within the charity. And there's lots of uh, those supports still exist and are far more supports now to get started. It's not a silver bullet. It is uh, its own function. It has its own skill sets. But personally, I feel it's it's a, a an imperative for the sector that we are looking at a situation where if fundraising drops 30% or government funding drops 30% or there's a giant recession or there's a whole bunch of disruptions to the system, um, I really, we, we watched the last two years of COVID dramatically impact a sector. For a social enterprise, for us, provides a level of stability and a lot, a lot of flexibility to be able to respond to some of the opportunities. So I very much feel that absolutely charities and nonprofits can start their own social enterprises because you start small. The whole idea is not to race to the equivalent of 10 trucks of expense and complexity. It's to start with your first customer and then your next 10 customers and then your next 100 customers and move at the pace your organization is able to absorb it. It's my lesson coming into this space. I'm, I, as I was saying just before we started, my background is a, I've spent my whole life in startups, uh, for-profit startups, and the pace is very, very fast. The idea of failing fast is, is a term you hear thrown around. Bringing that whole uh, mindset into the charity scared a lot of people at the beginning because it is a pace uh, that is uh, sometimes not usually seen in a charity. But we're at a point now where we have staff of all shapes experimenting and finding little wins and big wins and, and seeing uh, opportunities to make it work better. And everybody can do that. Every organization, my belief, uh, every organization could have a social enterprise. It may not grow to uh, be 80% of your revenue, but it certainly can be uh, create a number of opportunities that you cannot get through traditional grants or fundraising. So is, is your social enterprise equivalent to 80% of your revenue? Yeah, directly and indirectly, we're seeing uh, on average about 80% of our operating needs are covered by the social enterprise. And, and it's an important piece. Uh, all of your listeners have said to some some manager or ED, you know, I need better computers, I need more training, I need software, I need to go to this conference. And nine times out of 10, that request is thrown back at you, we don't have funding. We use social enterprise and that we generated. Tammy, who should have been speaking today, earlier on, I remember she, she's the uh, director of uh, development and, and is accountable for the social enterprise day to day. And I remember her saying, Dan, we, we really need another truck. I'm mean, okay, well, great, let's, let's, so, 
to get another truck, we need to cover another $2,500 of expense. So they grew the social enterprise for that incremental. Once we had it, we went and went to uh, Alterna at the time, got a social finance lease, got the next truck that created more jobs, that created more furniture, that helped more families. So it's uh, social enterprise gives you resources and cash flows that you can't get anywhere else. And it also opens up opportunities. Um, we had Ikea knock on our door. And, and while yes, they, they provided goods, as any good corporation would, they actually have hired us for the last two years to provide social enterprise commercial projects. Uh, so we're providing a service to this multinational company. They're thrilled with it uh, for all of the benefits that come from it. So these are opportunities that you wouldn't normally get if you weren't operating some form of social enterprise with the intent of making it as good as a for-profit counterpart. I, I just think your your own story of your own personal career path really highlights um, some of the challenges that charities might see, but also some of the great opportunities. I mean, maybe you could just share your own kind of experience of being headhunted for the role that you have. In my background, I worked in internet gambling, internet dating, uh, e-commerce, web, anything that was digital and scaling and helping. Uh, so that was my background. And uh, I had a headhunter reach out who had to work work with. Uh, just you ever thought of working at a charity? And I said something very inappropriate at the time, but she pushed me a little bit and um, uh, asked me to go go have a look at it. And this was back in 2013. And yeah, the they had a social enterprise. It had IT. It had the foundations. So I gave it a whirl. And uh, I never thought this is the longest uh, job I've ever had. I don't even think of it as a job uh, going on to my eighth year, ninth year now. Um, but a lot of it was bringing in uh, a lot of the behaviors and activities and the training that you normally would have in a, in a for-profit. <clears throat> For your listeners who, you know, I, I don't have a business degree, they say, well, can you, do you have board members who have business degrees? Can you engage local colleges who have uh, startup projects, uh, startup classes and things like that? Learning it isn't hard, is not impossible. You have to want to open yourself up and to uh, experiment with it. But everybody, once you that mindset takes root, then suddenly it becomes a bit of a flywheel. And suddenly it's not you saying, we need to do this. It's your staff saying, can we do this? Or we've already done this and here are our results. And that suddenly creates a momentum to create new opportunities. So it's, it becomes, I don't think I work in a charity. I think I work in a startup. I just happen to be a social profit versus for profit. It's a really interesting distinction, but also one that seems to be important to have that kind of mindset to be running a social enterprise is, is to really treat it like a business. And again, um, I guess the challenge for a lot of nonprofits, like you say, is this sort of um, way of uh, changing the way that they think or at least hiring the right people or the, bringing the right people on board to help them run those kinds of social enterprise operations that support their charitable work. Yeah, and, it, and it's not so much necessarily changing the way we work. It's so much as adding that there's additional ways that are we're allowed to think. So my experience when I meet my peers, I'm always like, well, there's a, a feeling that social enterprise money, it's like, it's, it's icky. It's like, it's, it's much easier, nicer to get a check from a major donor. And I agree, a check is wonderful, but it's very hard to do. But if you can provide, uh, so there's a, a resistance to learn this side of the world, uh, because it is foreign. So it's giving everybody permission to say, I don't know social enterprise, I don't know business. But there's lots of resources that people can learn who want to learn. And I think that's a, a real highlight is every organization has some little on entrepreneur who really wants to make their organization better. And they may be that little social enterprise seedling that you just have to give the right push to help you get started. Because again, I keep reinforcing it's start super small. Uh, whatever the social enterprise product or service you have, whatever you create, it's the priority is to sell it to the first 10 customers because you're going to get tons of feedback on whether it's a good idea or not. 
or whether it's the right service or not. And then you evolve it and refine it and then go sell it to the next 20. And then again, cycle back, make it better. So we're constantly, it's not the pickup business we had in 20, 2004 is not the pickup business we have in 2022. And it won't be as it is in 2030. So you've indicated that in, in some ways there might be a, 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 something of a resistance of traditional charities or nonprofits even contemplating um, social enterprise as being part of their functioning or their operations. W- what is the basis for that, do you think? Well, it's going to be fear. It's uh, many charities are uh, very successful in their own rights. Um, and they see this thing called social enterprise and the same applies to impact measurement or digitization of two other critically important topics. And they're big and they're unknown and they sound complex and they, and cause they are, and they sound expensive because they might be. And it's often easier to know because it, no, it's not us and rationalize our way around it. And I, I, I have to. Until you experiment and test and measure and really factually validate it's not for us, then you're rationalizing why not. Uh, The I think it's really important that uh, boards and management give give themselves permission to say we need an additional source of revenue. We need uh, and in some cases, in our case, it also provided additional capacity and capabilities, not just the revenue. Um, so we're some charities create, um, you know, a coffee shop or a parking lot as a way of generating revenue, but it's not directly linked to their objects. Um, in our case, our objects, you know, we very clearly highlight that, you know, collection, transportation, processing, repair, all of those things are, are a part of our objects. So we're, that's one of the ways that we're, we're fortunate in that we can be, we can grow our social enterprise as big as the social issue is, but uh, you know, for every organization, there's a way of creating opportunities uh, to generate cash flow. Um, I'm always quite fascinated by the, the cash flow cycle of the charitable sector, where it's very lumpy. Um, whereas, when a social enterprise, you you know, if you've got cash flow, and you, it's they say cash is king, and yeah. Uh, there was a time in early 2014 when the uh, we were in a fiscal crisis <laughs> two weeks into the job that I just started. And we didn't know that we'd lost $286,000 the previous year. And there were no, it's in February, to the audience, how many donors do you have in February writing big checks? Nobody does. Um, so we ended up uh, seeing the opportunities in social enterprise, we invested in marketing, we invested in a truck and, uh, because we proved that we could do it and we added the extra truck and that got us back to a uh, break even position in a single year. Uh, a lot went right, but, uh, social enterprise gives so much more flexibility than you, the traditional levers, uh, that a charitable or nonprofit organization traditionally rely on. Well, I want to ask you another aspect about running, um, a social social enterprise uh, within a charity. Are there important issues of governance that nonprofits or charities have to keep in mind when they're operating a social enterprise, especially when they're operating it as part of their charitable organization? So, you know, there's one, the standalone, I guess, is a distinction from where it's part of your mission as you, as, as you have indicated started your social enterprise. Yeah, no, it's a very, very good point, Mary. So if you're, uh, Within nonprofits, there's the nonprofit and there's the charity. So there are clear rules around uh, earned uh, operating activities within a charity. There are principles of, you can Google, there there are standards that the the business activity has to be subordinated, i.e. not as important as the social mission. Um, But there are definitely, if you're dabbling in a social enterprise, not a legal risk. Like accounting, you can have a small error, not a risk. But when you start to do this social enterprise as an intentional, ongoing activity, no different than others, you'll want to engage lawyers to make sure you're structured properly. Um, most organizations, uh, when they get serious of the social enterprise, will end up creating as a separate organization that uh, is uh, linked to the charitable and nonprofit entity. 
depending on your charity objects, you may be, it may line up that it is appropriate to keep it within, uh, within your legal entity. But again, that's where, you know, accounting professionals and lawyers can help guide you. You would say absolutely that one of the key issues, if you're planning on this, uh, and you run a, especially a charitable organization, that governance is something that has to be top of mind. And I assume that that's in part by the board, as well as the, your, your actual structures within your own, um, bookkeeping and um, reporting uh, obligations. Yes, and, and I think that's where we started was we looked at our charitable objects as, as what they're defined as, and you could give it to, uh, you know, find some college students who are looking for a course and look at this, this list of descriptors, what businesses are inside of these objects. And those are going to be the social enterprises that are most, you're gonna get the most benefit out of. If the objects don't clearly say trucking or parking lot or any of the other businesses that are out there, that's where you're, it's going to create more organizational friction than something that, you know, very, if you're, you're creating jobs, you know, create a kitchen, like there's, you're going to see opportunities within your charitable objects to, to let little entrepreneurship uh, begin. So again, that, that focus on detail and understanding that the, you know, uh, while it can be very successful, there are certainly very high responsibilities of governance uh, that go along hand in hand. No more, no more onerous than what we have being charities or nonprofits. I, I, it's, I would call it, it's just work. It's, you know, uh, we work with Miller Thompson. Hey, Miller Thompson, this is what we're doing. Please guide us. They'll give us the feedback, do X and Y, and away we go. So I don't want the listeners to think this is a, Got to talk to lawyers. I'm out, um, and I think that's a really important point. Is if you're saying I'm out, and you have no factual basis to say I'm out, then I go to the no because symptom of the sector of I don't want to because uh, there's certainly an opportunity that everybody can have some level of social enterprise activity. But you're quite right; it does add additional activities because you're effectively creating another entity. And, uh, you know, it was back in 2014, we had the fundraising team and they're, they're staring at all these operational people that are talking marketing and tech and logistics. And it is culturally, it's very, it's like, it can be oil and vinegar. Um, so there, there is, it's not a, it's not just, we're going to turn it on today and everybody's going to be all happy. Um, but once fundraising understands how, the, the results of the social enterprise actually empower their fundraising. We're at a point now, we, don't, we all know in fundraising, nobody likes to go first. Nobody likes to be that first donor. Well, in our case, Furniture Bank, every program that we're trying to fundraise for, we've already put our own money in as the first funder uh, to highlight that we're committed uh, to do those things. So that creates opportunities that you wouldn't traditionally have in the traditional fundraising ecosystem. Most of our individual donors uh, began giving after experiencing the uh, furniture pickup service and loved it, five-star Google reviews. And they're like, what do you do with our furniture in 72 hours? And once they ask, then we tell. And then they're like, oh my goodness. And so begins the relationship. So I, I guess if we would, could take that and condense it, all, your story and, and some of the wisdom that you shared with me today, and, and you were talking to nonprofits and charities just starting out, what would be your practical recommendations or advice? Um, and again, the common pitfalls to watch out for as well, as they begin to navigate this process of exploring social enterprise. So uh, the first piece is as a, a board and management and, and any, any staff that are involved in this little journey, give yourself permission to admit what you don't know, because it's okay not to know it. Um, it engage, spend the time, go, you know, if you're in the Toronto area, work with the Toronto Enterprise Fund. If you're in BC, Van City, there's lots of organizations uh, nationally like Interweave, uh, by Social Canada, that all are well are are experts far more expert than I am, because they're looking at it in a in a global sense. 
about the concept of social enterprise and give yourself permission, or I'll say it differently, ban the no because. You can't use no, we can't, and throw up the word because. Flip it around to say, yes, we could have a social enterprise if this was true, or we could have a building, or we could, or we could. That one tip was what changed it around for us in 2014, where I had this very resistant, no because culture, and we flipped the language around to yes, if, and that began, it's not a, it won't instantly cure things, but it allows the organization to go through the learning experience because it's not going to be a weekend reading and yep, I know what we're doing and off we go. This is going to be a, you know, a year long pilot of learning to get that first thing going. And even if it goes, it becomes an ongoing journey. So it's, it's uh, this is a bit of a marathon where you're, you're not trying to race, you're learning, you're networking. Uh, there's lots of successful social enterprises in Canada. I'm not the only one. Uh, Trico Foundation uh, out of Calgary uh, does some really good case studies of other organizations that are social enterprises of all different makes and sizes. So there, there are lots of social enterprises in Canada uh, and finding uh, opportunities to learn from them because we've all got our own, you know, I would never do this again and I certainly would do that uh, uh, conversation to be had. But absolutely, uh, if the organization's uh, mindset is we are going to find a way to start a social enterprise, you absolutely can have a social enterprise. It doesn't mean everybody's racing to millions of dollars of social enterprise activity. Every organization is going to have the right there'll be a right point where any further will be harmful to the organization, be it a stress to the staff or the volunteers or just operationally more complex. But a lot of it is engaging with the social enterprise ecosystem to learn because there's some really wonderful supports out there to help bring you in and get comfortable with what is expected. And would you recommend, I mean, you're obviously were part of the solution because of your business background and taking leadership as you did. Um, so you were the outside source that came inside um, to be able to lead this um, social enterprise within a charitable organization. But if you were an, an executive director that um, that didn't have a business background, what would you recommend that leader to do? If you're an executive director, um and you don't have business background, I would make sure that your next hire uh, coming in at that next level has business experience. You make sure you actively ask the board to recruit uh, board members with that type of business background to support you. Because it's uh, for that for that ED, they're not wouldn't actually be running the social enterprise. So it's not they would be faci facilitating creating the conditions that that new division could start. So it is not it they aren't expected to become experts in marketing and CRM and all the millions of things I could ramble on about, but they are expected to create the conditions that it might bloom. So the board can support when you hire new people, try and layer in uh, skill sets that you would find in business. Because there's, I can tell you, um, I went to my 25th MBA reunion and I'm like, I don't want to go. I just run a charity. I got people who run real banks. And it was most fascinating that I had most people hanging out with me going, you run a charity? That's so cool. That's, I wish I could do that. So there's, out in the business world, there are lots of people who would love nothing more than to, or we've actually seen it during COVID, pick up and say, I'm at, I'm going to go do something you, good for my soul. So there are lots of opportunities to pick up skills from the for-profit space and bring them in the, into this sector. Um, and if you can demonstrate the impact that you have as a charity, uh, it's it becomes very easy to get some really good skill sets in the in into the culture of your organization. Uh, fantastic advice. Um, I just wanted to close on getting your insights on um, what you're thinking about the new proposed bill 216. What do you think the impact will be? And do you have do you have any? I mean, do you like it? Do you have concerns? This bill is part of a much bigger uh, set of recommendations that came out about the charitable sector. So this, our sector hasn't been 
updated to modern standards in forever. So uh, this bill is uh, for those charities that are doing a lot of work beyond our borders. It's, it's fundamental uh, in order for us to have a more stable and a impactful and effective charitable sector. We have to make this change. So yes, this, this I hope, is the beginning of many updates. Well, thank you, Dan, for your insights and your uh, great advice. And I'm, it was a really fascinating discussion to hear about your background and, and the kind of uh, transformation you made in your own career. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mary. Happy to help.